This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of At Tim G311. And Dane, I think I'm pulling an early you where I can't remember the episode number. I don't have it in front of me. I don't know what episode number we're on. <laughs> well, it's and, been a while, so yeah. Yeah, we did miss our last scheduled recording, but I can't let it go by without saying it. So I'm looking it up right now. Episode 230. There we go. Episode 230 of At Tim G311. Wow, 230 of these, Tim. Can you believe it? <laughs> no, yeah. not really, because yeah. you know, it's been like, what, 10 years now? Next, yeah. Next year is going to be 10. That's even harder. <laughs> <laughs> wow, 10 years of my life, Tim. <laughs> I've been talking to you. <laughs> I guess we kind of like each other, don't we? <laughs> uh, I don't know, Tim. You know, we have some major disagreements. Uh, about uh, certain things so i don't know i don't know if i like you yeah <laughs> you know what i don't know if this podcast is going to work after all between you and me yeah, yeah i don't think so i don't think so too it's our final episode yes <laughs> 10 <laughs> years is all we could take of each other we're sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh man but no yeah that should be pretty fun to celebrate next year because i believe our first yeah. episode was in like march april kind of spring of 2012 Wow. <laughs> okay. I would have to look up exactly yeah. when our first episode actually was, just so we could <laughs> know for sure when it is exactly our 10 year anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, um, I haven't gone back and listened to our old episodes, but <laughs> I can imagine. I, I'm just wondering what we were talking about back then. Like, like what was our big thing, you know? I know. Well, obviously, the big thing was the Hyper Dark Knight Rises during that time, because we've got oh, right. at yeah. least a trailer or two. I think maybe just the first trailer. So we had that. But you know what? We should probably, that'd be fun to go back and what well, if we do a retrospective for our 10 year anniversary, just what exactly was our first episode like? I do remember what like the intro was for our first few episodes. It was like that robotic speaking voice that then started talking backwards. It's like, hello, you are listening to the Bad oh, Bands yeah, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. Did you put that together? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just wondering, like, if we do go back and then, like, what's our most, like, controversial, or what's one opinion that we had about, let's say, The Dark Knight Rises that we disagree with now, mm-hmm. you know? Or it could be, I don't know, the, the the Arkham games or stuff like that. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, like exactly. <laughs> like, what's the thing that we feel different about now? Or just even like the future of Batman movies after The Dark Knight Rises. Like, because we yeah. we knew that was it and didn't know what was going to happen, and then <laughs> knowing what did transpire, how ten years later we got two different Batmans <laughs> in that period of time. It's funny to think, funny to go back and probably see what we were saying. During the early episodes, it's um, I don't know. I think it'd be interesting. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I was like, we got to do that now. (laughs) 
But no, we're still not quite there yet. Um, we're still in the midst of our ninth year, <laughs> but uh, we are ending the year. Uh, this more than likely will probably be our final episode of 2021, but um, it's going to be one celebrating some big milestones and some big movies that <laughs> have come out to close the year out. So without further ado, let's get going into our usual minute by minute commentary. And obviously we're still on Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. And for this episode, it's quite appropriate, Dane, because we're going to be going from minute 19 to 20 and 20 being the big number, because as we're recording this episode on December 18th, 2021, tomorrow will be officially the 20th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. And talk about other milestones that you can't believe it's been that long. 20 years since Fellowship is, well, I can't believe it's already 20 years, but we'll talk about that after our minute by minute commentary because I can't let an episode go and not recognize that huge anniversary milestone of the Fellowship of the Ring. But um, we'll go ahead and go from minute 19 to minute 20. So as always, you want to grab your relevant media format that maybe was relevant back in 20, uh, 2001. <laughs> VHS tapes, I think we're still there. Yeah. <laughs> they were still yeah, being sold. Were. Yep. DVD players, definitely, obviously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I think Lord of the Rings was one of the biggest the extended cuts anyway, were some of the biggest DVD releases ever. And so Laserdisc, not so much, but I'm sure some were still being sold by then, just barely. Um, <laughs> Die hard. Beta, yeah, still Betamax, unfortunately not. <laughs> There's no beta <laughs> tapes being sold then. But um, I said Laserdisc, I got VHS, Betamax, so and Blockbuster videos, they were definitely still there. No one yeah. knew what was going to happen <laughs> just a couple of years <laughs> later, but so a lot of blockbusters netflix wasn't around just then or maybe they were around but they weren't obviously as big as they were a few years later and as they are now don't actually know when they were actually first established but it might have been 2001 i'm not sure but um your film projector obviously those are still around in movie theaters and your dvhs not quite there yet because we sure. obviously had vhs but no hd <laughs> And then the one that we only knew back in 2001 what the ultimate media format would be. I probably would have held off on seeing Fellowship of the Ring in the theaters if I just knew this was available. Sure, sure. <laughs> Your VHS to converted DVD copy. I mean, who knew back then what you, that you'd be able to do that? <laughs> <laughs> if I were to go back in time 20 years, I would, tell, I would only tell my younger self that, that that's what you have to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, just, just just hold off on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, there's going to be an ultimate version. Um, <laughs> 20 years it, later, there's going to be an ultimate 4K box set. I'm yeah. not just Lord of the Rings, but The Hobbit. Those films will be made. But don't buy that. Just <laughs> wait. <laughs> there's something that's going to be in between that time period. That's going to be the ultimate. And you won't be disappointed. <laughs> All right, so I've got all those, <laughs> and you're ready to travel back to 2001. We could start our commentary. So, Dane, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right, three, two, one, play. As Bilbo is still clinging on to that ring. Gandalf, not quite suspicious yet, but having that question look on his face. Is, is Gandalf a bad wizard, or is he a, a good one? Because Not, I mean, you would think that like a, a a a wizened wizard, I guess you could say, like would know that hey, something's wrong with that ring. No, I think he's definitely a good wizard, but at the yeah. same time, there's lots of rings of powers out there that, as Gandalf mm -hmm. later says, none of them can be taken lightly. But so he knows Bilbo has the ring, obviously, but. It's not just not the one ring, but hey, if it wasn't for Gandalf and his suspicions, none of this <laughs> kind of stuff would have transpired. So actually find the one ring. Yeah, right. And the smoking competition. <laughs> that Gandalf <laughs> easily wins by making a boat out of a puff of smoke. And the fireworks go off as we reach minute 20 on the 20th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. Man, things are just working out real perfectly and seamlessly <laughs> in our yeah, topics no, right now couldn't have planned it better tim right so good thing good thing we didn't record a little two weeks ago right <laughs> yeah no <laughs> we wouldn't have the symmetry <laughs> yeah so before moving on to our future topic like i said i gotta gotta recognize the 
and celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring, which again, I can't believe it's going to be that long. I just remember perfectly seeing it for the first time. That's kind of what I want to talk about. It's our memories of the, our first time seeing it and just our favorite moments from the movie. So um, for me, I probably said this before as we talked about Lord of the Rings numerous times on this podcast, but how I always knew of it, but never read the books, wasn't too familiar with the overall story. I just knew basic characters' names like Frodo, Bilbo, and Hobbits. That's about it. Um, but I remember back in it's around the summer of 2000, spring, summer 2000, I remember, and they put out like the special behind the scene teaser video just showing you that they're in production and kind of what to expect, giving everyone their first look at it. And I remember a friend of mine, Jason Palmer, who's a great Star Wars artist that you've probably seen tons of his great work on. Uh, he's the first one that kind of said to me, my brothers and friends of ours, hey, this video's out, you got to check it out. And he sh- showed us the link to the trailer or the video footage. And seeing it was like, oh, wow, this looks like something that I've never seen before <laughs> in a movie. And just hearing him talking about more of the books and what's, like I said, me not having too much experience with it, telling me a little more about it, just getting real excited for it. So ever since seeing that first kind of behind the scenes video reel about it and just getting my first look at it, just made me excited for uh, the following year to see it come out. And then in 2001, went to a midnight showing of it. That's back when the earliest you could see it was midnight (laughs) the day before a movie premiere. And that, which thankfully it's early premieres a lot earlier now because <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to go to if they were releasing Lord of the Rings now and they had just only midnight screenings and they're three to three hour and a half or four hours long after the extended cuts. I don't know if I can make it <laughs> for a midnight showing, but back then I was younger and I could handle it. So I was super excited. I went with a friend of mine and another and another friend with just the three of us who saw it. And it was just such a great not only just a great experience in the movie and just being blown away by everything I was seeing, but just also just a great theater experience was one of the first like good crowd reactions I've seen in a movie. Probably before that there was Phantom Menace where you've seen videos of Star Wars fans cheering before it starts, but um, kind of nothing during the movie. But this was like the first one where during the movie I, I experienced where there was cheer at certain moments. Uh, the biggest one being one. Aragorn fights, uh, lurts the Urukai at the end, uh, and chops his head off. That got like a big cheer <laughs> in the crowd. I was like, oh man, I never really had this happen in the movie I thought I've seen before, but it's awesome. But I, I just remember sitting in that theater, being excited for it. But there's just a really cool feeling of going into something you're not t- too familiar with, and it just completely blows you away. It's rare when that happens, and Fellowship of the Ring did exactly that. Just everything worked on it. The, obviously getting gross to the stories, the the characters who are perfectly cast, the visuals, and then the music, which I think is a really awesome sign that a movie is going to be really special when you're hearing pieces of music for the first time and you immediately fall in love with it and just think to yourself, man, this is just perfect music to the visuals and to the world that you're seeing. I mean, I can only imagine that's what it felt for everyone seeing A New Hope for the first time in 1977. And for me, Fellowship was kind of like that. It's just everything clicking on just perfectly for something I knew very little about. And it was just such a special experience. And I was coming into it from also during that time, during that time, I was playing like a lot of Japanese RPGs. And I remember seeing the fellowship. There are certain elements, especially when the fellowship is formed in the second half. And they go through the mines of Mor- Moria, the Battle of Amenhen, and then going to different locations of Lost Lorien. It just felt like I was watching an RPG game come to life and it's like, this is one of the best video game movies, but it's not based on a video game. But if they were to do like a Zelda movie or something like that, this would be the path and formula to follow. It's just really good. So there's all these different things going through my head while I was enjoying it, enjoying it so much. So yeah, it really left an impression on me seeing it for the first time. I now consider myself just a really a lifelong fan of Lord of the Rings and the franchise. i hesitant to call myself a diehard because I I think you could say a diehard if you really know the lore and just like the backstory and the history, which I know a little bit of and I find that stuff fascinating, but I just haven't had the time to really do a deep dive into that. But I've kind of been doing that a little bit lately. I have been on a little bit of a Lord of the Rings trip because I did 
get that aforementioned 4K box set and did a marathon of all six movies, and that put me on a real Lord of the Rings trip. So kind of been doing a little bit of a deep dive. There's a great YouTube channel. Shout out to a Nerd of the Rings. Uh, it has great videos of talking about the history of specific characters and their travels, and there's a lot of great stuff to get information on more of the lore than what you get in the books and or the, definitely the movies. So I've been doing that the last two weeks, just really going down the Hobbit hole, I guess you could say, of Lord of the Rings content and Middle Earth content for the 20th anniversary. So yeah, it's just a special movie. Uh, it's probably my second favorite movie of all time after The Empire Strikes Back. It's it's, a, it's such an amazing experience, and it's cool to be celebrating its 20th anniversary and have it recognized as the special achievement in filmmaking that it is. So, yeah, that's my memory of seeing it for the first time and just how it had such a big impact on me. So how about you, Dan? What was your memory of seeing it for the first time? Uh, well, I, I believe I mentioned this before, but uh, my cousin was a real big fan of the books he he had read them before he rereads them he, he likes that he, he likes the fantasy setting right um mm. and so j- just going off of what he said uh, like this is going to be amazing and you know all this stuff uh, i remember I, I i couldn't get in because i was i wasn't 13 yet oh right? really <laughs> they're yeah. that strict for pg-13s wow <laughs> yeah so i had to go with him and we both went, and I remember seeing it, and unfortunately not liking it. I, I just did not <laughs> like it at all. But it was a little fantasy, too long for you, Dane, at that young age. <laughs> yeah, probably, even though it was the regular theatrical release. Um, uh, I, I've mentioned this before. I'm not really a big fan of fantasy. I just can't get into it at all. Um, same thing with some sci-fi. Like, I just cannot get into it, but... I think the sci-fi is because Star Wars has kind of spoiled me on it, on mm. everything sci-fi. Uh, but fantasy, I just cannot, I, I just couldn't get into it at all, and no, no matter what medium it was. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't like it. And it was that thing where it was like, my cousin was like, oh, you, you didn't like it, but but you just got to wait. For the, for the second movie because they're going to do another one and it's you, you just have to wait for the second movie because there's a, this huge battle and it's really cool and you know he was explaining he explained to me the the uh the battle of um, uh helms deep is it uh uh-huh. yeah. yeah yeah and he's explaining to me like how like you know there's this the city and then they got to defend it against the orcs and like all this stuff and i'm like yeah but you know this the the, the first movie was awful <laughs> you know in, in my head and man like, if i knew you back then dean <laughs> yeah we wouldn't have 10 years of podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i just remember not liking it at all and um just really didn't expect to like the second movie uh really was looking forward to it i i didn't really get it and like like you were saying um you know about that youtube channel all these people all these diehard fans that know you know the the deep lore behind uh the trilogies or or, or the books um you know i that's the one thing that turns me off uh of fantasy it's just like sure. that sort of like there's a lot of it if you really want to get so, it. yeah like fifteen thousand years ago yeah. you know, <laughs> on this place you know this happened you know sort of thing and it's the same thing as sci-fi it's it you know it's the same thing i mean it's weird how like my opinion on that hasn't really changed you know same thing with sci-fi where it's like introduce a new planet and they have to get into the politics and they have to get into like 15,000 years worth of um, uh, the economic evolution of the planet it's like okay we have gotta move past this and tell a story yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah I I remember not liking it for a long time um, these movies I, I, and I don't know what it was that really changed me and I think it was probably the extended cuts because I remember uh, borrowing them from my cousin because he was such a big fan. And I, 
were watching like the the documentaries on it on um yeah. the, the making of the film and i thought that was cool yeah which to this um, day are the best bonus features for any movie you're gonna see they're right. just perfect yeah you get like a two-hour documentary and so like no longer than that if, for like each movie <laughs> it's like, yeah yeah there are some portions that are two hours long <laughs> but then you got other <laughs> documentaries on other topics it's just so much great stuff yeah and then i started to appreciate it through whatever it was in those special features um uh i i, I began to appreciate the, the lord of the rings a little more So, so we yeah, have that's, so we yeah. have the appendices to thank for <laughs> getting you to appreciate Lord of the Rings and to becoming a fan of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I I remember going to see all three movies in the theater when they came out and just not liking them <laughs> at all. <laughs> and just so getting what? To, like totally lost. Where you know, so, sort of like how I am with the Marvel movies today, where it's just like I just don't get it. Like what happened in that last movie? <laughs> um, or that first one, I, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I, I can't remember, you know, so it was more of that, you know. So when, like, how long after they came out, when you watched it again, did you go, man, I actually really like this? <laughs> uh, probably around, like, you know, later, probably around. 2007 2008 so the movies had been well out okay yeah dvd so well it's as i say it's never too late to become a fan of something (laughs) yeah so uh, glad to have you on board because funny you're mentioning like asking me all these questions about marvel's movie stuff but going back to uh at the beginning of the episode talking about our episodes from 10 years ago and our early ones I don't know if it's quite like during that first year, but kind of early on in our run, there'd be episodes where you'd always ask some Lord of the Rings questions <laughs> to me and ask yeah. certain things about the history. I tried to answer as best as I could, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like it, the, the the fantasy genre just isn't for me. Um, and I'm, I've been thinking, I've actually been thinking about that a lot because you've been tweeting about. Uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Like, what was it that really turned me off of uh, Lord of the Rings? Um, uh, my cousin was also a big fan of uh, uh, the Wheel of Time series. You know, there's like that new show on Amazon. Yeah. Um, like, what was it? And like, I've been thinking back, and I have to say, it was a Game of Thrones. <laughs> that really turned me off of the uh the, the fantasy genre Be- because it's not lord of the rings and it's not like elves and stuff mm. you know it's it's more grounded and it's grittier and it's because i remember really liking that book when i read it as a kid don't let your kids read that book <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're expecting lord of the rings type content in there yeah it's gonna be a first shock <laughs> Uh, don't let your kids read that. So um, I think it was a, a Game of Thrones, really, that really turned me off because I remember really, really liking a Game of Thrones and not really liking uh, anything else lately, like, like the Baldur series, uh, the, the Baldur's Gate series. Okay, man, I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, like the Dungeons and Dragons type uh, R.A. Salvatore yeah. books. Yeah, I just could not get into those. Uh, no matter how much uh, my friends or my cousin recommended uh, those books to me, I just couldn't get into it. I, I think it was because I read um, a Game of Thrones, you know, when I was younger. So yeah, <laughs> that's my. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't as positive as you understand, but uh, I came around. Eventually. Yes, <laughs> that's all that matters is the end. The end of the journey. Yes. <laughs> It's like Frodo. He, you know, technically he didn't destroy the ring. He fell victim to its power as well. But at the end of the day, the ring was destroyed and things <laughs> ended as they yeah. should. So one, we'll one, uh, one finger later. I yeah. Think <laughs> yeah. But thankfully you got to keep all, you still have all 10 of your fingers. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, funny story, Tim, because uh, the, the, the reason why I couldn't record uh our last weekend or whatever or our previous recording day uh, is because uh i got myself hurt again 
<laughs> Did you almost lose a finger? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so on uh, Thanksgiving weekend, uh, or Thanksgiving day, my uh, my brother-in-law and I decided to go fishing because they live right near a dock, right? Um, mm. So we just decided to go down. And he was fishing and I was just watching because I'm not, I'm not really into in a fishing um and he had caught something big right? <laughs> or something strong and, was it uh, as big as a fish that pulled a deagle into the lake and where he found the one ring <laughs> um fish not so much because he he snagged the eel oh wow. <laughs> okay. so he snagged the eel and um it's probably the biggest eel i've ever seen in uh my life <laughs> uh it was yellow uh it was prob- probably only like four four and a half feet uh maybe five feet uh but the, the width of it was a good seven eight inches uh, okay. so it was really big and he brought it up from the water and then he needed a little bit of help and so i grabbed the fishing line um, should have been wearing gloves, but you know we didn't have gloves. So <laughs> grabbed the fishing line. And all of a sudden, the um, the eel kicked and went uh, went back underneath the water. <laughs> and uh, my cousin, I mean, my uh, brother-in-law lo- lost control of the reel, and uh, the the line almost cut my fingers off. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, it wasn't fun going to the uh, the ER on Thanksgiving and uh, having to get stitches, but um, yeah, I almost lost my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, That's we why we couldn't cl- record. <laughs> yeah, well, we, good reason. I'm glad you're okay, yeah. but man, yeah, I guess it did come pretty close to really being like Frodo <laughs> at the yeah. other day. So I lost it. I almost lost all four of my fingers. Oh, <laughs> but it just been a thumb. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I take it you're not going to go fishing ever again. <laughs> uh, not for a while. So yeah. I, think I think I'm kind of over it. Um, Would have been cool to catch a, or at least touch a eel. <laughs> well, well. It wasn't an electric eel, was it? <laughs> you know, touch it no, and then get shock. No, <laughs> no it's a, I don't think it was, but um, yeah, uh, would have been cool. But uh, it's it's cooler to have all your fingers, Tim. I don't know <laughs> if you agree with that statement, but I would think so. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's why we couldn't record last week. <laughs> oh well, glad you're okay, and we're yeah. back recording now with all of your fingers intact. That's the important thing. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, uh, Tim. Oh, yeah. Sorry. More uh, time. Let me to interrupt you. Uh, uh, speaking of Peter Jackson, I gotta ask you. Tim, oh yes. What did you think about the Lovely Bones? The Lovely you Bones. The, yeah, the Peter Jackson <laughs> movie. Uh well, as much as I love Peter Jackson and what he did with <laughs> the Fellowship of, or the Lord of the Rings, Hobbit. And a more recent project he did, I've never seen The Lovely Bones. But wow. <laughs> I imagine you're going to ask me more about his latest release, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What did you think about this this forgettable latest release? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, talk about outdoing yourselves with uh, the length of, of, of your movie project. I mean, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, three hours almost four hours forget that we're talking eight hours total of the beatles get back documentary (laughs) yeah i mean i i loved it i thought it was great it's just i think those i I don't think it's going to be for everybody because it's not your typical documentary it's literally like that fly on the wall type of movie where you're just sitting there watching the beatles come up with songs play music perform talk discuss you're seeing them interact just as friends it was awesome to see as a diehard beetle fan so i absolutely loved it my dad who is the ultimate beetle fan was in heaven for eight hours him and his good friend who who they played music together with they just were absolutely in love with it they've been waiting 50 years for it and they're the type of beetle fans where 
some stuff gets hyped out, like it's hyped up of releases and ends up being disappointed. They're kind of a hard audience to please when it comes to new Beatle material. And they were absolutely blown away by this. So they were my measure as far as like <laughs> how great it really was because they were absolutely in love with it. But just even me as a big Beatles fan, I loved it as well. It's just really cool to see him in that element of recording an album and re- writing songs. We're seeing songs come to life, classic Beatles songs come to life right before our very eyes. I mean, there's that moment that everyone's talking about where you see Paul literally come up with the tune and melody of Get Back while he's just sitting there with his bass <laughs> and he comes up with it and we see the song progress into the one we know and love today. And there's other examples of songs like Two of Us is another great one. I love seeing the transition of that song becoming a rock song into an acoustic song was cool to see too. So just a lot of stuff like that. And Peter Jackson just did a great job of putting it all together. Um, and just, like I said, making you feel like you were in the room with the band and just getting a look at them that we'd never seen before. So it was really cool. I loved it. That's just another feather in Peter Jackson's already impressive movie making hat. So yeah, I thought it was great. My favorite part was, um, uh... The fact that they wanted to do the final concert in uh, Libya. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it was Michael Lindsay Hogg really wanted it to be in Libya for some reason at that Coliseum thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was really pushing that. <laughs> Just, yeah. That's all he pretty much cared about was that performance. <laughs> it's not yeah. the very end. But no, my favorite part was definitely in the third episode getting the. Uh, the in real time uh, concert on the roof. Yeah, it's, I I don't know about you, but I've never seen that. I've only seen like small little snippets mm. and uh, of course pictures, but yeah, I, I never really saw that. Um, I yeah, like you said, it's it's not for everybody, and um, I, I think like the sort of critics and people that review stuff kind of went overboard with it because um, you got to realize that this was a really, really bad idea, right? (laughs) To have to write songs, make an album and um, do a live concert all at the same time and and film a documentary special at the same time. Mm, Uh, And also on top of that, they are essentially recording two albums at once, right? Yeah. Because they're they're doing the the songs from Abbey Abbey Road, and they're doing the songs from Let It Be. And not uh, to mention so. songs that would eventually show up on their solo albums too. Like, that was another right. thing that stood out to me: just how much of the songs that were that we know come later were all written during the, those sessions. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um, I, I just love the whole fly on the wall thing and just letting it play out and seeing, you know, the Beatles just jamming on songs that, you know, they, they had no plans of putting it on the album. They were just trying it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I like you, Tim. I love it. And I think the, the, the major lesson that we can, we can gather besides the fact that let it be uh, you know, it, it it is my favorite Beatles album. Little, uh, oh, interesting! I never knew that. Yeah, it's it, it is my favorite album, and um, you know, besides the whole thing, like I said, being a bad idea. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I think the major lesson we can take from this documentary is that uh, Billy Preston makes everything better. Yeah, <laughs> you know that, that is true. I mean, <laughs> you instantly see like. The mood change with everybody once he came and he started jamming with them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and John's pretty much out like you're in the band, like you're the fifth Beatle now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was Billy Preston definitely, and um, I, I guess being in a more comfortable setting, you know, not on yeah. a movie set. <laughs> yeah, that was the other thing where things definitely got better for the the band once they moved into the Apple Recording Studio. <laughs> yeah. See, <laughs> so, yeah, I loved it. I loved it too. Yeah, it was great. So that was awesome. And I believe, because I still, it's been a long time since I actually saw the actual Let It Be movie. I think I've only seen a, like a bootleg copy because it hasn't been an official release for that since forever, like, since I, before I was even born. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's supposed to come out at some point too, just to like, kind of have everything out there. 
but it's going to be hard for the, to compare that with this now because <laughs> this yeah, one is no, just, shows them in such a totally different light than kind of what the actual let it be movie does yeah like you said it looks amazing to him like it yeah i, I don't know if it, did peter jackson did do restoration of the footage yeah. right yeah he definitely like, did like extensive um restoration right yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's why i was like wow this looks really clear this looks like it was filmed yesterday oh so, yeah uh, so, yeah. Everything about it was sounded great. It looked great. <laughs> I mean, it was great. <laughs> yeah, I love how too. It's kind of like the total opposite filmmaking for for Peter Jackson, where it's just from Lord of the Rings, like these extensive, almost two year shoots <laughs> that he's on, just stressing out, and those came out great. And for this, for a documentary, he just gets to sit back in, in a studio, in a living room, watch fifty hours of Beatles footage to try to put together a movie. It's like the total opposites and opposite ends of the of type of filmmaking but yeah. if anyone deserves kind of to just sit down and watch 50 hours of beatles footage beatles footage from we know it's his favorite band and so just him i'm sure he loved that uh he deserved it after what he did with lord of the Rings. so he deserved this type of i guess break of, or more relaxing i guess you could say <laughs> process of making a movie it's not only the footage right it's also the audio recording yeah <laughs> because there's a lot of audio recordings and they know, had to sync uh, them up too yeah they had to put yeah. together the audio just the audio with the footage so i imagine he was in heaven during that process <laughs> <laughs> only peter jackson could have done it <laughs> yeah i would think so because he's got to have that passion you know because that's what, another cool thing on the lord of the rings bonus feature you just see how much of a big beatles fan he is <laughs> in those special features or even talking about scoring for the score for fellowship he just talked about what a kick he got of being at abbey road for the first time knowing that's where the beatles recorded and had to take that iconic photo of himself and a few other people doing the walk down abbey road so you just know he was a diehard beatles fan during or way back then so i was happy for him to kind of do the you got to make this movie which i'm sure was a passion project for him so happy for peter jackson in that regard as well that's why he uh, hasn't really directed a, a movie in what 12 years 10 years um, that long he did he did some other stuff i think like smaller stuff because um he did that i know he did that animated movie that uh, adventures of tintin um, I'm not sure, not, what year that came out though I, I don't think it's been that long maybe it has <laughs> i'm looking it up as they're being surprised how long things have been or how long it's been some certain things maybe that has been 14 to 15 years ago uh mortal engines he didn't direct that though that was like he just produced it oh 2014 i guess you could say okay uh that was the the battle of uh, the hobbit the battle of the five armies yeah I'm just trying to think if there's anything after that, but maybe there hasn't been. <laughs> nope. Uh, uh, they Shall Not Grow Old, which is the World War One, uh, Sort of like like what he did with Get Back. Yeah, how he restored that. Yeah. But that's, that's it. So when was, was the, when was the, that a Tintin movie released? Uh, I'm not seeing it on his filmography. Really? Yeah, let me see. And that was something like him and Spielberg. Like, am I getting it backwards? Like, like he directed Spielberg produced, or was it the opposite? Oh, uh, uh, Spielberg directed it. Okay, then he uh, might have been producer uh, on. Peter Jackson uh, produced it with there Kathleen Kennedy. Yeah, that was a good movie, though. Really? I never. Yeah, the uh, animation saw one it. really good. Is it is it fully animated? Yeah, mm. oh. it is kind of like that realistic style animation to it, where it does look some certain shots looks like it could, it could be real. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my mistake. I thought that was when he directed. Yeah, maybe that's why he hasn't really done a, a film in a long time. I don't blame Let's him. For, what was his? Yeah. What was his last thing? Besides the yeah, the lovely bones was the last thing that wasn't a uh, Lord of the Rings 
Hobbit movie. And that was before, way before the Hobbit, I think. It was like 2009 yeah. or eight, something like that. Uh, nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, it was uh, King Kong. I don't know if That's you remember right. that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I didn't mean to uh, sidetrack <laughs> your Lord of the Rings thing. Okay. <laughs> it's all flows together. It's all goes with Peter Jackson related, Lord of the Rings, the Beatles. It all works. <laughs> <laughs> But with that, uh, I guess we can get into our main feature topic for this episode, which could only be our review for Spider-Man No Way Home. Yes, the movie is out. And by the time you're listening to this episode, at the earliest, it is <laughs> next Thursday, uh, December what 23rd. So the movie has would have been out for a week if you saw it on Thursday, December 16th. So... I've seen it. Dane's seen it. We're going to be talking spoilers. So the spoiler warning is out there. because <laughs> This is, I think, the only movie. I know there's been others, but I think the first movie that's really put the no spoilers into the marketing of it. <laughs> Where you got the cast saying it. You got it on posters and certain promotional tweets and stuff. So this was something that they really wanted to keep. A surprise for most audiences, even though, and I've said it before, most of the surprises in this were the worst kept secrets ever, but still, <laughs> at least they tried on their end. So we're going to be going uh, full blown spoilers into this discussion. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. So my initial reactions first, obviously super excited for the movie. We knew about the potential of what this movie might have in it. And for me, as a lifelong Spider-Man fan, I absolutely loved it. <laughs> it did not disappoint and was actually have certain elements of it, I would say, even better than I expected. And I'll go into why later, but it just delivered. And I don't want to say on the promise, but because they never really promised anything <laughs> as far as what went down. But stuff we would suspect. Obviously, we knew some of the older villains were coming back. Green Goblin. Dr. Octopus, played by the original actors, Alfred Molina and William Defoe. So you knew the potential was there for what else might happen in this movie. And it did not disappoint at all. And yeah, I absolutely loved it. Just I, I, mean, there, I was excited for a lot of reasons going into it. Just in its story of picking up from where Far From Home left off with Peter's identity getting uh, revealed to the world and how he would react to that and how that sets up everything that transpires in the movie. And then, of course... Um, looking back at previous Spider-Man movies with the villains showing up. So there is this and potential other cameos of Marvel characters that I heard rumors about and was hoping would come true. And it did. So <laughs> uh, just a lot of stuff that worked so well and just lived up to my expectations. And when it comes down to it, though, what I think it just really did well was telling a really good classic Spider-Man story and what the character is all about amongst all the cool surprises and um, nostalgia stuff that was in the movie. I think at its core, it was just an awesome Spider-Man story to see play out on the big screen. So, yeah, I have a few nitpicks here and there about it, but they're mainly just nitpicks and not really huge problems. But, um, yeah, overall, everything about it worked for me. I absolutely loved it. It just did not disappoint. And I saw it on Thursday night. Got to say, one of the best, if not the best, like, crowd theater experiences ever. The cheers and the roars, man. People... I'd never seen this before in a movie where people got out of their seats and started clapping and shit, moving their arms like they're at a baseball game and someone just get a walk off single or something like that. It was just insane, but so awesome to see. So yeah, just overall great experience. And I just love the movie. So yeah, couldn't be happier with it. How about you, Dane? I'm on pins uh, and needles. It, it, <laughs> initial, <laughs> initial uh, impressions, right? Yep. Uh, um, yeah. I really wasn't looking forward to it. Um, like I said before, uh, this Marvel stuff, I'm completely, totally lost. I totally forgot that Peter Parker's uh, identity was out in the public. Uh, <laughs> did you even see Far From Home? <laughs> to yeah, think I, did. I did. <laughs> I did. I own Far From Home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, totally forgot. I uh, totally forgot that um, uh, well, there was one other thing I totally forgot that um, that 
pertain to this movie, but I I, I can't the remember stereo, right now. Like uh, framing him, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, that I think okay. it was that something with Mysterio. Um, totally forgot about. <laughs> I, I guess the entire Spider Man movie. Uh, the two previous Spider-Man movies. <laughs> it seems like you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just judging from the the trailers we got, I thought this was gonna be a bomb. Like I I, I didn't think this was gonna be any good at all. Um, was really pleasantly surprised about how much <laughs> I liked it. Uh, so glad to hear. <laughs> I I I. I I didn't really think I would care about like the different multiverses coming together and like mm-hmm. now we have three different Spider-Men and um you know Alfred Molina is there and Jamie Foxx is there and you know all these different people and all these different villains and um I just didn't really think I'd care for that because it's like yeah but we all know they're going to go back to their their own universes and stuff and you know Peter's going to find a way to, you know, sort of get everything back in order. And mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be setting up the next Avengers movie or whatever, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to set up something else. And, you know, this is just going to be another uh, in-between movie that's not really going to have implications on really anything, you know, sort of like. Like Civil War, in the sense that it was supposed to be a Captain America movie, but it ended up being a, a fourth Avengers movie, fifth Avengers movie. Um, I know it gets kind of referred to as Avengers 2.5, which is understandable. Yeah, yeah. So, sort of like that. Um, and so I was like, yeah, but I'll just go see it as a pure entertainment. And um, it, it works on that level. You know, especially it being a comic book movie, and that's the mm-hmm. thing. Like, this is a really, really comic book movie. Oh yes, <laughs> a really, 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 really comic booky movie, which is what I don't really see people talking about. Like, yeah, uh, which is honestly people... pretty crazy that we're at this point where this type of comic book storytelling is now in a movie and kind of accepted by audiences, where they could do stuff yeah. like this now. Like twenty, even maybe ten, fifteen years ago, I wouldn't think that'd be possible. Multiverse yeah, or, stuff. Or... <laughs> Or it could still be told, you know, it, it hasn't been done to death. Yeah. Uh, because what I felt this movie was, you know, just first impressions is a retcon. Mm. It, that's that's what it is. You know, it's like, okay, it's it's a whole new beginning for um, Spider-Man. Mm. There is literally no way home. Yeah. <laughs> after this, so. That's a good point, yeah. Uh, and, you know spoiler alerts you know they kill me um i didn't expect that um, me neither yeah coming out of nowhere uh so there is literally no way home and this is a, a soft reset of the entire universe at, at least the spider-man universe because i can't really yeah. speak on on the uh other superheroes but at least for spider-man um you know, it, it is a soft reset, like we would see in a no uh, a, a new fifty two or something like that. Mm. Uh, that's the way I see it. Yeah, but I I totally I totally love that. I fell in love with it. It's uh, I haven't been impressed with the movie in, in this impressed with a movie in a really long time, and it's so good to see it see it in a Spider Man movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You you hit on a great point there about kind of being like no way home for this version of Peter Parker because that's like you said it ended it's a whole new status quo for this version of Spider Man. That was another part of the reason why I thought it worked so well and just how it all built up to that moment. So yeah, just kind of going back to the beginning of it and just how it picks up immediately where Far From Home left off. And if I could just have say one of my nitpicks about it the movie right away um as i felt like the beginning of it it was kind of moving at a fast pace with that um subject of everyone knowing who peter parker is and him trying to deal with that i like what we got but there were just certain instances where i felt certain scenes felt a little rushed and just kind of try to get through it and one of them is kind of one of my favorite moments but also one that i wish was 
done a little bit better, and that is the appearance and cameo of Matt Murdock in Spider-Man No Way Home, played by the one and only Charlie Cox from the Netflix Daredevil series. First off, I'm just so glad he's officially brought into the MCU now in one of the movies because even though the Netflix shows, they reference events from the Avengers in the movies, it's they're like we're never 100% in the MCU canon because they weren't made by Marvel Studios. Kevin Feige wasn't really involved with those series. Um, so they were just kind of under the branch of that but now that charlie cox is in this movie we know that his version of daredevil or he is the mcu version of daredevil and that's awesome and also um spoiler alert for hawkeye <laughs> the show but um vincent d'onofrio is officially back as kingpin in that series so uh, the two standout stars of daredevil are in the mcu and i love that but i just his appearance i loved it and the interaction he had with peter and may uh, Happy Hogan and just giving him the legal advice. And I, I'm i looking forward to seeing it, the movie again. And I'm going to see it later this afternoon because there were certain moments where the crowd was cheering so loud I couldn't hear the dialogue. <laughs> and when Matt Murdock showed up, that was one of, a, one of those instances. So I didn't really hear his first bit of dialogue. But um, one of my nitpicks is that I just felt his introduction was just, that was one of those uh, scenarios where I thought it was a little, felt a little rushed and just kind of happened too quick where you just see him immediately in their apartment giving them legal advice. I kind of would have thought it might have worked better if we see him show up while they're being incarcerated, being talked to by the government agents, and he shows up as their lawyers, like kind of getting out of that scenario. And then he introduces himself as Matt Murdock, and they go back to their apartment. They have that discussion and all that. It just felt like he just showed up and he was there. <laughs> so as cool as it was to see him in that great moment where he catches that brick that flies through the window. He just says <laughs> that great line where uh, I'm a really good lawyer when Peter asked him how he did that. So I loved all that stuff. Just kind of wish we got a little more of an introduction for uh, Matt Murdock at that moment. But still, it was one of the cool cameo and surprises that uh, we got in the movie. Well, not necessarily a surprise for me since I've heard that rumor, but it was never one that was like really concrete that it was going to happen. It was one of the things I was just really hoping for. And when it happened, I was just kind of more relieved than surprised but still cool nonetheless so um yeah the first part of, i guess the first portion of the movie wasn't the greatest part of the movie i don't want to say it was bad but it just felt like there were certain instances felt a little too much where they were trying to get to the main moment which was him uh going to dr strange and send all of the events in motion but um, this that was one of the nitpicks I had. Uh, not many. I have one more, and that's just more from a comic book, comic booky standpoint. But we'll get to that later. Any thoughts on the first section of oh. the movie, Dink? <laughs> uh, I was like, did you cut out, Tim? No, <laughs> uh, no not really. I, I I really like, and you see that that's that's the thing, Tim, because like I, that that's why I was just sitting back and listening because. You know all like the fine little details, um, but yeah, it was great to see uh, uh, Charlie Cox again because it's like I it, it, it's it's common knowledge that you know his his show his Daredevil show was ended unceremoniously and out of nowhere. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great to see him. Yeah, I'm just glad like Marvel Studios recognizes when you already got a great actor for the roles don't need to recast them, even if it's technically might be in a different universe or something like that. They're perfect. Yeah. Just use them again. <laughs> I think we can uh, all accept uh, the fact. Of, speaking of TV shows, uh, you know, on Disney Plus, we have, you know, the Hawkeye, new Hawkeye show. Mm. We have the WandaVision show, the Captain America show. I really want to see a Ned show. A Ned show? <laughs> that would be... Yeah. Really entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I want to see a Ned show. I mean, hey, Ned training to become a Sorcerer Supreme. I mean, the hints were there in this movie. <laughs> I want to see him at MIT. You know, I want to see what's going down with, with, with Ned. Hey, I'd be down for it. Like, you could split time trying to make, make it through college while also training with Doctor Strange or something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We you just created the next Disney Plus Marvel series, Dane. Congratulations. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's my only thought uh, from Spider-Man No Way Home. I hope uh, 
I hope people know that I want an edge show from, <laughs> from me watching No Way Home. <laughs> no Way Home. If there's one takeaway from the movie, that's it. Yeah. No, yeah, so obviously we get to the point that we've seen in the trailers how everything transpires with Peter and Doc asking Doctor Strange, which was actually different than the trailers, where they're because we just assumed, oh, he's asked if he make everyone forget, but he actually asked them if we could turn back time to prevent Mysterio from ever doing that. And obviously he can't because Doctor Strange no longer has the time stone. And it was Doctor Strange's idea to kind of do the spell that makes everyone forget Peter and how we got a little more explanation how it works, why everyone came or the villains we saw came into this universe, how it was those who knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man, that they're the ones who got transported here. It wasn't everyone. He was able to contain that spell and the from fully breaking out into the into that uh, orb in that box or whatever. But a few did slip through the cracks. And boy, I will say from when I was enjoying the movie and the about the first part of it, but once we get to the moment where Dr. Octopus shows up, I mean, that's when the movie kicks into another gear and it gets into another gear later on. But what it, when Dr. Octopus shows up on that um, highway leading to the airport, man, it's like, <laughs> that's when the movie was like, man, I'm, I'm absolutely loving this right here. It was just, first off, a cool action sequence was this version with Tom Holland Spider-Man in his armored spider suit taking on Alfred Molina's Doc Ock. It was a cool action sequence to see play out. And then just their dialogue with Doc Ock. Think he was thinking he was talking to the Tobey Maguire version of Peter Parker from his universe. And when he finally unmasks, unmasks him and he sees Tom Holland, he's like, hey, you're not <laughs> Peter. And then you get Peter kind of infecting the uh, his octopus arms with the Stark tech and then taking control of it. <laughs> that was really cool and fun. So it was a cool action sequence. Spider-Man saves the day. He helps that woman he was trying to talk to to get Ned and MJ into MIT, rescues her, but then the pumpkin shows up. <laughs> and then we get the appearance of William Defoe's Green Goblin in his, I, I'm hesitant to use the word classic because it's not my favorite <laughs> costume design, but. Um, Power Ranger suit. Yeah. Power Ranger suit. That's what you call it. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And I got to say, I I do like the use it for his first appearance because I mean that's what everyone remembers from his version of Green Goblin so you got to have it in there but then the kind of where he smashes the helmet <laughs> I don't know if that was their way of saying yeah this doesn't really work but I would love what they did with him later and kind of giving him more of that traditional Green Goblin costume with the purple hood and how William Defoe really doesn't need a mask to portray that evil goblin look. Like not, nothing against William Defoe, but <laughs> he does have that look <laughs> for that evil, crazy <laughs> goblin <laughs> that we know from the comic. So it was better just to have his natural face with the hood on and everything than uh, that Power Ranger mask. So I did like what they did there. So yeah, all that setting up with Dr. Octopus, Green Goblin, and might as well just talk about Green Goblin because I really loved William Defoe here as this version, not this version, it's still the same version, but this um, new take we see on him. I mean, he was great. He was great in Spider-Man 1 in 2002, but I think this one, see, I, I want to see it again to really say if this was his best turnout yet, because what he does to Peter in this movie, I think is what makes Green Goblin one of, if not Spider-Man's biggest antagonist, like his version of the Joker. I mean, my favorite personal villain for Spider-Man is Venom, even though he does become <laughs> more of an anti-hero and kind of a friend later on. But those early Venom Spider-Man stories are my favorite. So he'll always be my favorite Spider-Man villain, but it's hard not to recognize that Green Goblin is Spider-Man's greatest villain. And I think that was on display here. What he did to him and while we messed with him mentally, playing fooling him thinking he wasn't under control of the goblin but winning his trust just as norman osborne and just really seeing that sincerity that he was bringing to it to wanting to help everybody and cure and that was another aspect of the movie i liked just on spider on a spider-man level just how he was really set on helping these villains when he found out that most of them end up dying in their own universe and dr strange was going to send them back anyway just tell him hey this is their fate the fate of the multiverse depends on it. If they end up dying, so be it. But Spider-Man being the great character and hero that he is, had to try to help him out and find another way. And the fact that he did 
and kind of took all these villains and brought them together <laughs> into that apartment, Happy Hogan's apartment that they were hiding out on, trying to find a cure for all of them to send them back to the universes so they won't be have to fight Spider-Man and then end up dying. It was just great. I just love that they were bringing that aspect out of the character of Spider-Man and him wanting to help these people. And um, Norman Osborn really playing on that while really just using it to his advantage. And just seeing also the scientific side of Peter Parker really show up in this movie was great. And that moment where he's finding the cure for Dr. Octopus and that chip for his arm and then cure for Electro using the arc reactor and Green Goblin's formula. It's really cool seeing that on display. But the moment William Defoe turned or, or revealed that he was actually still evil in the Green Goblin, that's where the movie went into another gear. And that just might be mo- one of my favorite moments of the movie, that entire sequence when it's revealed that um, Green Goblin is really still evil. And he just makes the other villains turn against Spider-Man. And Spider-Man is just on his own trying to fight off Green Goblin, Sandman, Electro. And while Aunt May's trying to escape with that formula, and it all cultivates into that great tragic scene where Aunt May dies because of the Green Goblin. And man, just great performances by Tom Holland here. Just his reaction and trying to be stay with aunt may as she's she's dying and he kind of doesn't want to accept it but at the same time knowing this is it and he's gonna be with her till the end and it was heartbreaking to see and we kind of saw because we didn't see it in the mcu what happened to uncle ben what was that moment that kind of made him really become spider-man and the iconic line great power comes great responsibility we finally hear it uttered in the mcu and it was uttered by Aunt May, and I thought it was done beautifully how, for this version of Spider-Man, this was kind of that moment. Even though he has been Spider-Man, obviously, for a few years, this was kind of his big uh, coming-of-age moment, I guess, <laughs> really becoming into Spider-Man and what it means to be a hero and losing um, the ones that are closest to you like this because of your actions as Spider-Man. So I just love this aspect of the movie and just what it does for this version of Spider-Man and how it changes him as a character, as we see later on. And the fact that Green Goblin was the one that kind of uh, made this all happen, it was just done really well for him as a villain. That's why I think this might be a, the William Defoe's better portrayal as the Green Goblin, more so than in Spider-Man 1, for what he did here and how he really changed this version of Spider-Man. So I just love this entire dynamic of bringing all these villains from the different universes together and having it work so well as it did. And that, like I said at the beginning, at the core, just driving home and being the catalyst for telling a really great Spider-Man story that we have loved to see being fans of the characters. So this was just one of my favorite moments of the film and just setting up for what's to come later, uh, which kicks the movie to another gear. But I love this entire sequence with uh, just Tom Holland, Spider-Man, uh, interacting with all these villains leading up to that moment with Green Goblin and Aunt May. Yeah, and that's one of the things I sort of, I mean, one of the things I sort of realized when watching this movie is that like these three movies or the two movies don't really have like that iconic scene. I guess you could say. See, I think they do, but uh, maybe not on this level. But I'll I'll say that right. Yeah, like how in the first Spider-Man, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie, there's like that upside down kiss, maybe. Mm. The second one, uh, MJ and Peter sitting in the in the diner, and then um, Duck Ock attacks. Yeah, that they, entire sequence uh, leading up to the train fight was iconic. Yeah, um, I don't know. In the third one, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say infamous the dancing sequence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Andrew Garfield maybe skateboarding. <laughs> <laughs> skateboarding <laughs> um but but these uh, and the tom holland ones don't really have that i think this might be it uh you know the scene with, with may dying or you know it, you know in the it, in the latter part of the movie where all, all three of the spider-man are talking mm-hmm. um and they're trying to like tell them like about people they lost and stuff like God. that moment um, man so good <laughs> maybe maybe that and uh but yeah it's for me this is the scene that uh that i'm remembering these spider-man movies for yeah 
Yeah, it was great. And of course, that's sets things kind of on more like the story took a darker turn, that's for sure. But boy, did it get a lift when <laughs> we got the appearance of none other than Andrew Garfield first and then Tobey Maguire. And boy, like I said, the theater erupting, man. <laughs> did it, it went crazy for Andrew Garfield <laughs> when he first showed up. That's where people jumped out of their seats and started just cheering. It was incredible. And one thing I was curious, though, because obviously, like I said, it was kind of the worst kept secret, but <laughs> still didn't lose the effect watching it for the first time. Because I was wondering, how are they going to show up? And this is the other thing I really loved about the movie and why I think it's really a special Spider-Man movie. Because one of my worry was, even though I was expecting Toby and Andrew to be in it, was that they would just show up for like the last 10 minutes for the final battle. Spider-Man's Tom Holland is in the battle by himself fighting all these villains. And then at the last moment, Toby and Andrew show up in their Spider-Man costumes and they're there for like the last 10 minutes of the movie. But no, they're in this a lot more than I was expecting. And it was all the better for it. And just even the fact how they first appeared where it was Ned with the sling ring from Doctor Strange <laughs> trying to get in contact with their Peter Parker, but ends up accidentally finding Andrew first and then Toby and then this interacting first with just Ned and Ned's mom and MJ was a lot of fun with Andrew kind of having to prove that he was a Spider-Man <laughs> and sticking to the walls and then cleaning the cobwebs. And then when Toby showed up, it was like the theater absolutely lost it. <laughs> it was just, I didn't hear any dialogue that he spot us. So like said first, that's why that, that scene is what I'm anxious to see uh, most when I see it again, because I didn't hear a word out of, Toby's mouth and Andrew's mouth when they first appeared. So I don't know what their first bit of dialogue was. But man, it was just awesome. And then just how cool it was, not only just seeing them as Spider-Man and Peter Parker again, but seeing them together on screen was just such a trip, man. <laughs> it was just almost like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. But then we get to the moment that you mentioned, Dane, where first it's Ned and MJ comforting Peter. That was just a great moment in itself. But then Man, there's so many great shots in this movie when we get to this point where like I can't wait to use them as gifts or like my Twitter uh, header <laughs> image. And one of them is just where you see Toby and Toby's Toby's Peter and Andrew's Peter just sitting on top of that building and kind of in their Spider-Man pose and they jump down. And man, that conversation they had with Tom Holland, Peter Parker, it was a surreal experience, really. Just both of them recounting the tragic moments in their lives and their movies that we saw happen toby's with uh losing uncle ben andrews with gwen and just seeing tom holland's reacting to his loss all three of them in that moment man it was just it was incredible to see and this this is what makes me think as far as since like i said we didn't know what the story is with tom holland's peter's uncle ben and when toby's talking about his you see toby's re or tom holland's reaction kind of like he was tearing up it just makes me wonder if his is he recounting the same thing for what did what happened to Toby's Peter Parker? Something similar happened to Tom Holland's because we don't really know, and I don't know when we'll find that out. We might find out in his animated series because there's that new one coming to Disney Plus about uh, the early days of the MCU's Peter Parker and him becoming Spider Man. So maybe we'll get the answers then, but it's still left for interpretation as to what happened to Tom Holland's Uncle Ben here <laughs> because he does make reference of something like that happening in Civil War. So I did think something happened, but just how different it was um, compared to what we saw in the F Toby Spider-Man and Andrew Spider-Man. So, but that was just a great I, I, scene. I'm not making it. I'm not making this up. Uh, I think did, did did Uncle Ben have uh, cancer? Um, no, not in the. You talk about the MCU, right? Him, yeah, I'm talking about yeah. the Tom Holland. No, they they haven't yeah. mentioned him at all. All the only thing he's gotten was in Far From Home when he goes on vacation. His briefcase has the initials of Ben Parker on there. And then yeah. in the What Ifs animated series, um, he makes mention of, the, of Uncle Ben in an episode. But again, that's in another universe because it's What Ifs. So <laughs> that that doesn't really count. But so far, it's just that briefcase with the initials. <laughs> the only indication we had of Uncle Ben here. Uh, let's see. But yeah, that was just a great moment. And then after that kind of seeing them not only because obviously we knew that we we're all going to work together as spider-man but just kind of all of them working together as 
Peter Parker and knowing how smart they are, just coming up with the formulas and cures for each of the villains. That was really cool to see and made for some funny moments too <laughs> between all of them, especially when we knew this had to happen, but I was glad it was acknowledged where both Tom Holland and Andrews Peters are kind of in shock of Toby's web being organic and just coming out of them. <laughs> that was great to have them joke and uh, have fun with that too. And then them kind of when they go to the Statue of Liberty for the final sequence, where they're talking about some of their uh, craziest villains, and you see <laughs> Toby talking about Venom, and he's talking about Rhino, which is probably the worst Spider-Man villain we've seen in a movie <laughs> as far as when it comes to <laughs> portrayals and looks and designs. <laughs> <laughs> so all that banter and dynamic between the three Spider-Man, it was just God, it was like one of those moments where I can't believe I'm seeing this. <laughs> it was one of those instances of the movies that I just love having when you're just so happy, but you can't believe what you're seeing at the same time. Oh, so good. But then it comes to, you know, the big moment where we're going to see all three of them in action against. Um, it wasn't the Sinister Six. We never did get another member <laughs> for the villain team up. So I guess it was the Sinister Five. <laughs> Um, or maybe really just four because Dr. Octopus was good by then. But then the final battle between the three Spider-Men in their suits, I was like, oh, man. <laughs> it was just incredible seeing them all together on screen in their sc- movie-defining costumes. It was just awesome to see, especially Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. That amazing Spider-Man 2 suit, um, I was going to say is still my favorite Spider-Man suit, but... I don't know. By the time we get to the end of this movie, there's a new contender. (laughs) But still, at this point, seeing that suit in action again was great. And just seeing them at first trying to work together and it's not working because Toby and Andrews um, don't know how to work as a team. They've all been solo. And then I love how Tom Holland goes, I got experience working with a team. I was with the Avengers. And Toby's all, oh, that's great. Who are the Avengers? (laughs) Just really showing the difference between the universes. I loved it. So good. It was a fun action sequence. I can't wait to see more of it again because everything was, ha- I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Everything was going by so fast. I, I really want to take it in and appreciate probably what's some really cr- cool action sequences from a Spider-Man movie, from a Spider-Man movie that we never got to see before with all three of those Spidey, Spideys in action and for some great poses. There's that one where they all just land on a portion of the Statue of Liberty. Like I'm waiting for that to become available to make my Twitter image, <laughs> Twitter header profile, which I'm sure a lot of people will be doing because it's already an iconic shot, in my opinion. It was just so cool and so much fun to see that in action. But again, at the end, once we get to, they kind of cure all the villains and then Green Goblin shows up as the final threat. And then he's might he was so close to taking away MJ from Peter as well as she's falling and we saw, we saw this in the trailer, what everyone suspected was going to happen actually happened, where Tom Holland couldn't get to her, and Green Goblin takes him away on the glider, and then Andrew Spider-Man jumps down and saves her. And boy, the reaction uh, that moment got was one of the loudest, too. And then it went from a cheer to like, oh, <laughs> from all the people in the audience, when you see Andrew Garfield's face and just reacting. It was a great moment for his character, too, just kind of doing what he did in do for one and just how that still uh, defines him and how much it still pains him. It was just a great moment there for his character. But then uh, as cool as it was seeing all three Spider-Man in action, my favorite part of the action sequences of that action sequence at the end was just Tom Holland's Peter against Green Goblin one-on-one. This is kind of like one of the few times we get really, uh, an extended hand-to-hand combat sequence with Spider-Man because it's usually kind of him swinging, throwing some kicks and punches in, but really just no swinging involved, just him and Green Goblin duking it out. And man, he was going all out. Tom Holland, again, another... I, he took his performance to another level in this movie. And this was another instance there where he was just really set on killing Green Goblin despite even the encouragement he got from Toby and Andrews Peter at the in that moment on the rooftop where they were talking to him for the first time. Um, he was still going to kill him and he almost did. And just the emotion and expression on Tom Holland's face, man, he just really sold it as being someone who's so hurt, but determined to do this thing that he knows uh, is wrong, but he just can't help it. And I just loved how at the very end where he got the glider and it looked like he was going to do the killing blow. It was Toby's Peter that stopped him from doing it. And 
I might be wrong here, but I don't think he said anything. It was just he was just look. They were looking at each other, and Peter Tom Holland's Peter knew that he can't go through with this. And then <laughs> Green Goblin stabs Toby's Peter in the back. <laughs> and I don't know, Dane, did you believe for a second that this was going to be the end of Toby's Peter? <laughs> No, of course not, Tim. No, you know yes. why? <laughs> because they're going to bring him back. They're going to bring him back. Something's going to happen. And uh, we're going to have two Spider-Men fighting side by side again. Yeah. <laughs> three. Sorry, three. Yeah, a lot of people in the theater I knew were scared at that moment. There was a big old gasp. <laughs> but I was, I was at the same time I was thinking, no, nah, they're not going to do this. This is going to put a damper on the whole team up thing, like to have one of them die at the end. So like, no, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I just like how Toby just rubs it off saying, uh, I've been stabbed plenty of times before. <laughs> I'm OK. But yeah, just a great ending to a great action sequence here leading to that final confrontation between Green Goblin and Spider-Man, as it should be. As I mentioned before, Green Goblin really being Spider-Man's greatest antagonist. And man, it just all culminated into a great moment. I know I kind of rambled on there about this whole ending act of sequence and how great it was. But yeah, this is where the movie just went to an unexpected level of awesomeness. So I couldn't be more pleased with how something I was expecting to happen happened and just exceeded expectations. Man, what a great finale to this movie. You know what uh, would have made this movie a lot better, Tim? What's that? If we had, and, and this is the reason why I'm going to give this um, a negative review. Um, <laughs> if we had Dane DeHaan. <laughs> hmm, I wonder why you want him back. <laughs> uh, no, he, he's just my favorite actor, Tim. I can't, I can't really, uh, I don't know why. Can't he's put your finger on it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, Claire Danes is my favorite actress. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I, I I I just don't know why. You know, and they should have thrown in Kit Harrington's character from the Eternals, oh, Dave yeah. Whitman. So, <laughs> you know what, Tim? You know what? I don't like this movie at all. <laughs> I take back what I said at the beginning. I take back what I said in the middle, and this is my zero out of five review. <laughs> <laughs> My, how quickly things have changed while talking about yeah. it. <laughs> you never know how you feel about a movie until you're actually talking about it with someone. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but no, no. I totally love this this ending sequence. Um, but I'm really, I, I, I really want to talk about uh, the ultimate end, Tim. The mm. ultimate end of... Uh, the Spider-Man as we know him, really, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, his and his world as we know it in the MCU, yeah. Yeah, or his role. Yeah. You know? So. So, yeah, that was the big change. That This was something that I wasn't expecting. I was kind of, I was curious how things were going to end. Is, like, are they just going to send everyone back? Are they going to be incorporated into this universe now? So I was pleasant. I'll, yeah, I'll say I was pleasantly surprised with what they decided to do. I have a feeling, I wonder if this is going to be uh, some that fans are going to be split upon because I'm not sure everyone's going to feel about what happened, where the only way to send everyone back is for everyone to not only forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but they're going to forget Peter Parker, that they even know him. And just, you know, what a sacrifice that's going to be for Peter. But at the end, again, this is why I felt this movie really told a great Spider-Man story. Spider-Man doing what he does best. Again, going back to great power comes great responsibility. Making the ultimate sacrifice uh, for himself, putting everyone else above him uh, for what he wants. And man, those moments of saying goodbye. I mean, first off, geeking out of the spider hug <laughs> between all three Spider-Men hugging at the end. That was great. But then just the emotion emotional goodbye he had with Ned and MJ there. I mean, that was like really sad to see play out. Seeing these characters in multiple movies, again, this is what's great about the MCU. Everything that builds towards these big moments, they're all earned because these characters appear in different movies before we get to these big moments, and it just feels so earned. And it was you know, sad to see Peter say goodbye to his best friend and his girlfriend there. And it was, I didn't expect it. I kept thinking, now something's going to happen 
there's going to be some wrinkle in it that, you know, some MJ is going to remember, Ned is going to remember, but everyone's going to forget. That's kind of how we went at the beginning. But no, everyone forgot that they know Peter Parker. And it was kind of crazy to see at the end play out where the moment where Peter is at uh, the, sh- the restaurant that MJ works at, he sees her and he sees Ned. At first, I thought they were going to make it where MJ and Ned are, are a couple. <laughs> That's just really going to be a knife in Peter's heart there. But it did a they didn't look to go there just that they're still friends but him not kind of because she said to him like you better come find me and tell me or i'm gonna figure out like i did before and he was and um i'm still not quite sure why he didn't (laughs) as far as kind of do that yet maybe he saw they were happy and they might be better off not knowing him just yet and have all the burdens of knowing spy about spider-man so yeah that was crazy to see play out but i really like it again it just goes to what makes spider-man a great hero and a character the ultimate sacrifice that he has to make and how time and time again peter parker will always do that and that's why i just love how this movie played out and i also like it too because what it sets up for future spider-man movies because uh, we know for sure we're getting more thankfully (laughs) kevin feige amy pascal tom holland they've said you know their stages are already being planned for the next spider-man trilogy And I couldn't be more excited for that now because we're kind of going to a period of Spider-Man stories that I grew up reading where it was kind of Peter Parker, um, not necessarily on his own, but because he he was married to MJ by this time in the comics, but kind of in the animated series, too, from the 90s, where he's on his own. He's out of school. Well, he will be out of school soon. (laughs) He's a senior in this movie. He has his own apartment. Um, Nobody knows he's Spider-Man. And those are kind of like the Spider-Man stories I grew up reading. And while I love the MCU take on Spider-Man and felt that the story decisions that I know were controversial for some Spider-Man fans had to be done for introducing Spider-Man for the third time in a movie series with a universe that has heroes. So things had to be done differently from the traditional Spider-Man story. And I thought the MCU did a, did a great job of doing that. But I feel now what's been set up with Spider-Man really on his own, we, get, we might get more of those traditional Spider-Man stories um, in these next movies. And boy, as I said, I thought earlier we're seeing Andrew Garfield's Amazing Spider-Man 2 costume being my favorite. I think that might change with this new suit that Tom Holland had at the end. That was classic Spidey on screen. Just (laughs) pure nerd bliss right there. The bright colors of the red and the blue. This how the design of it was just straight out of kind of those original Spider-Man comics. I love that new costume already. So... (laughs) Things have changed for the MCU version of Spider-Man, but at the same time, I couldn't be more excited than I am to see what the future holds for this version of Spider-Man. And I'm just so glad that um, we are getting more because this does have the feeling like this could be the end. And if it was the end of Spider-Man in the MCU, I would be totally satisfied because it did feel like a an end of an era with this story. And I would have been pl- definitely pleased if the deal with Sony and Marvel ended and this was it. I would be content. I would be disappointed, but at the same time, I felt we got a full arc of a story for this version of Peter Parker, and it was told beautifully. Um, because I remember when, uh, after Spider-Man: Far From Home, there was that period where Marvel and Sony they kind of split up. They didn't agree on a deal, and it was revealed that Sony's gonna gonna do their own version of Spider-Man with Tom Holland now. And I just can't even imagine now what that would have been, knowing what we got with No Way Home and how perfect it was for me. I don't even want to think about what could have been if they didn't reach a deal. So (laughs) thank you to Tom Holland for getting the ball rolling to making Disney and Sony talk to each other again and for getting this deal done because we got one heck of a Spider-Man movie here and it sets up uh, the the potential for more future great Spider-Man movies. So yeah, I love the ending and I was surprised, but I just love what it sets up and what it does for his character. So it was just a great finale for this movie, I thought. You know what the ending made me think about <laughs> is like how you know su- superheroes keep their identity secret, right? Mm-hmm. And like the people that they love, they they don't be with them and they don't tell them who they really are. And so, like, aren't you really putting yourself at risk? I mean, putting other people at risk by not telling them. You know what I mean? Like. Like if 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 I say, look, Tim, I'm Spider Man. There might be a guy that's gonna come. He's dressed in. A, he looks like a Green Power Ranger, and he <laughs> might kill you with a pumpkin bomb. 
I'm just letting you know, okay? I'm just letting you know. <laughs> wouldn't that be like more? <laughs> oh yeah. Wouldn't that be better that that you would know and you would be looking out for that instead of me or uh, hoping that I save you? Well, because right? it goes back to the whole thing. How's the villain gonna know who's your friend and who's not if they don't know who you are? So I mean, you definitely yeah, there's always, always that risk. Find out. They but... always find out though. <laughs> and then, oh, you know, all of a sudden, MJ is, you know, suspended on a crane, and I gotta go save her or a bus of kids. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. See, that's it's, why I think why Peter didn't end up saying anything to MJ there. Maybe that's why he thought of. I mean, it, doesn't yeah, want to put them like, in that scenario again, but. You should have been like, look, you don't know me, I don't know you. <laughs> well, I mean, I know you, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me. Um, there was this magic spell that happened and uh, you might be at risk. I'm just letting you know because I'm Spider-Man. <laughs> I mean, A, you would sound completely crazy <laughs> going up to a complete stranger and saying maybe, that. But... Maybe she will completely stay away from you thinking you're crazy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if you just say it like that. But w- w- wouldn't it be better for like, you know, like, like you, you even go back to like uh, Bruce and Rachel in the Dark Knight trilogy or the first movie, right? If 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 he if, if you just tell the person, you know, look, this is who I am, and you gotta look out because there's people after me, and just because we have you know this relationship, no matter if it's platonic or romantic, they might come after you. <laughs> these people that don't like me might come after you. You know what I mean, <laughs> kind of. I, I still think it's safer when they don't know. It's that's old saying: yeah, ignorance yeah. is bliss. So <laughs> that, when it comes to superheroes, to put yourself in danger, I think that's true. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, like like I said, I I really I really like this retcon. This, I mean, that's what we should probably call it, right, Sam? Yeah, or um, yeah, or a reset. <laughs> reset yeah I, I i really like this choice um uh, and Tim, yeah, i don't think you marvel fans need to worry tom holland will be back yeah <laughs> a spider-man in a new spider-man movie just might take a while but he'll be back um i just really like this retcon and it's it opens up the character to like a whole new possibility where you don't have to stick with what you've done before necessarily. Mm-hmm. Sure. You, you have to reference that. Oh, this magic spell happened. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows that I exist. They only know that Spider-Man exists. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it's, it's such a brilliant way to, to do a reset and to um, continue the story, yeah, that, totally. um, you know that that could get old after a while. Um, I mean, you, you just look back at the, the Iron Man movies and how they just got lesser in quality as the second and the third one went on. But it's just such a brilliant way to continue the Peter Parker Tom Holland story. Um, yep, and I. I, I kind of I, I really want to see what they do with it. Yeah. Yeah, I make this too. And I would because, you know, a plot point of the next movies is going to be at least MJ finding out he's Peter again. But I would, how I would do it, I would do it slowly. Like if they have a new trilogy plan, this don't even have like MJ or Ned in the next one. Just let's just focus on Peter dealing with this new status quo for in his life. I mean, he's in his own apartment now. He's alone. Uh, nobody knows yeah. pretty much has no friends really because nobody knows who peter parker is so just seeing him deal with that for one movie just really embracing just him as spider-man and facing down whatever villain is going to be and then maybe in the second one you you reintroduce mj and ned again and then work into how they find out because we know they're going to find out like that he's peter again and um maybe the third one of this next trilogy will end up with peter and mj getting married and that's the last one, and hopefully, don't do this one where he has to go to Mephisto and have him erase everyone and their, uh, or erase their marriage and all that type. Let's not go down that road. But um, 
No, yeah, I, well, I totally well, agree how it sets up an exciting yeah. future for the next movies. Uh, definitely more of a Spider-Man 2 vibe, right? Yeah, you know, well, how that ended. Where, like, no, no, like how he uh, uh, Peter is in Spider-Man 2, where he's not having a really good time. And it's he's he's poor. Uh, he's trying to get he's he's trying to make money, but he's trying to be Spider Man too. Yeah, at the same mm. time, you know. Yeah. Um, because it's not like the Tom Holland uh, Spider Man is wealthy, right? Independently wealthy, like no. <laughs> like Bruce Wayne, right? So like more of that sh- that sort of vibe. You know? Yeah, I mean, it could set up to where we finally see. Tom Hall and Spider-Man go to work at the Daily Bugle as a photographer. I uh, just yeah. said it like like I said, yeah. setting up stuff that's kind of more in the familiar aspect of the character um, that I grew up with uh, when I was first reading comics and watching the animated series. Like the set of juggling school and uh, friends and high school like relationships, all that he's going to be struggling with trying to make money as an adult and uh, as a photographer for the Daily Bugle and Spider-Man dealing with James and all that type of stuff. If they finally like go into that route, I think it's gonna be awesome to see Tom Holland Spider Man uh, deal with all that stuff. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal wasn't in this movie, right? No, uh, just you he heard his voice <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I don't know why. I I, I just saw the the, the cast list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was saying they might have shown a quick shot of him movie, as Mysterio right? in the beginning, but you definitely heard his voice. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah, but he didn't show him anything, right? No. Uh, yeah. That's what I thought. So yeah, that's where the movie ends. But um, the end, the post credit scene and the mid credit scene, um, the mid credit scene one. Obviously, we knew there was going to be something with Venom it, that was being teased at the post credit scene of Venom. Let there be carnage, where he gets transported into the MCU universe, MCU, and he sees Spider Man on TV, and he like just becomes entranced with him. So. I was curious if that was going to be followed up in, in the actual movie or if it was going to be in a post credit scene and it ended up being the mid credit scene. And at first when it was going on and it, it happens like, oh man, this is kind of a disappointing. He's in the universe, Eddie Brock, and he just already disappears. We didn't get the Spider-Man Venom interaction. But then we see a little piece of the symbiote remained on there. And I was like, yes, <laughs> the seed has been planted to have the symbiote in the MCU and may hopefully make its way to Peter Parker. And this could be one of the few remaining things on my nerd wish list of seeing in a live action movie, the classic black suit, Spider-Man symbiote costume, how it looks in the comics translated on screen. I mean, if we get that, Oh man, I'll, <laughs> my Spider-Man movie uh, wish list would be fulfilled because <laughs> that's the one thing that hasn't happened yet and i've you've heard me complain about this before so i'm excited about the potential of the symbiote and venom playing a part in these next spider-man movies because as i said venom's my favorite villain and to see him in interact with tom hall and spider-man is something i really want to see and i'm hoping to since um tom hardy's eddie brock got transported to his own universe hopefully the mcu version of eddie brock I hope they still have Tom Hardy play him. It's just, it's this universe version of Eddie Brock. And it could play out the way I was hoping for, where how one of my biggest disappointments of the Venom movie was how he got the cost, the symbiote first without it going to Peter. Um, but now that the symbiote or a piece of it's in the MCU, it's set up to where it can go to Peter first and then go to Eddie Brock to have that Spider Man Venom face off that um, done the right way that I've been hoping for. So, the seed has been planted. So at first I was kind of disappointed with that end credit scene. But then when I saw the symbiote remaining, I was like, okay, I'm happy and satisfied with it now. <laughs> so um, it w- I went from disappointment to excitement pretty quickly on that end credit scene. And then the last one was pretty yeah, much. Me too. Oh, Wait, sorry. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Tim. I, I just have to interject. Because no, go ahead. Yeah. I, I also am excited for the symbiote being in, you know, this, this MCU because we have the potential, Tim. It's a potential of having a Tom Holland, Peter Parker dance sequence. <laughs> oh, that's your wish. Huh? That's your only it's, wish for that. <laughs> yeah. That is my only wish because we have to have a dance sequence in a Spider-Man movie. We had it with Tobey Maguire. We had it kind of with Andrew Garfield and Skateboard. 
<laughs> yeah, they have one. For tomorrow. See, that makes me worried and kind of upset that if people, like a general audience, only associates the symbiote now with, and Peter Parker with dancing. <laughs> See, that needs to change. So hopefully that's what will happen if done right, <laughs> if Peter gets the symbiote. So yeah, wash away that, that stigma. Uh, the keyword there, done right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so I did like seeing that. And yeah. then the final end credit scene was pretty much just a trailer for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which looks crazy in itself. Uh, one thing that the two things that stood out to me, one, obviously, the evil Doctor Strange from the What If animated series is making a live action debut, which is cool. But then we saw Shuma Gorath. And Dane, do you remember from the Marvel vs. Capcom games, or Marvel vs. Street Fighter, the green squid monster character that was in those early games? Uh, no he's like his one big eye he's a squid but that was my first introduction to the character and the only experience i've had with the character of shuma gorad so but now i'm going to be seeing him in live action and he looked pretty close to how he looked in the marvel vs. capcom games but coloring a little different so those are the two things that stood out to me for that and of course it was cool to see wanda again as scarlet witch as we know she's going to be in the movie so obviously the events that took place here are going to affect Doctor Strange in a big way in his movies. So <laughs> it was different to get a trailer for an end credit scene, which we haven't gotten since the first Captain America movie because the post credit scene for that was a trailer for the Avengers. So it's been just about 10 years since that happened. So I guess they're, I wanted to go back to that formula, at least for this. So yeah, closing thoughts overall. I absolutely love this movie. It exceeded my expectations that were already high. And it's a few nitpicks here and there at the beginning, but once it got going with its main plot in the multiverse, it did not let up. It was just fantastic from almost from start to finish. <laughs> but man, I, it was one of I one of those moments where I just was never as happy as I was as a Spider-Man fan than being in the theater that night. And I can't wait to experience it again. So yeah, I'm giving it an easy five out of five. Who is uh, Dormammu again? He's the big villain for Doctor Strange. He was at, only at the very end of his movie where Doctor Strange goes into the dark dimension and goes into that time loop before he lets Dormammu let him out and leaves or stops from him from attacking Earth. I I do not remember Doctor Strange at all. I've seen Dark, Doctor Strange. I don't remember a second. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dane, you just need to do a full MCU rewatch. Just do it. <laughs> They're Why, all I'll on Disney Plus, except the Spider-Man movies, but... I will just forget it. <laughs> Not if you watch yeah. them again and again. <laughs> It'll be my own retcon. I'll be yeah. MJ and all this mess. Yeah. <laughs> or Happy Hogan. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I'll let Tim. 4.99.9. No, you know the reasons why. You know the reasons. Uh, if only Dane DeHaan was in it. It would have been a yeah. five, right? <laughs> yeah, I just can't give it a five without, without Dane DeHaan, my favorite actor. Or Kit Harrington as uh, the Black Knight. It was so close for a superhero movie perfection for you, Dane. <laughs> so yeah. close. Just can't do it, Jeff. I can't give it a five without Dane DeHaan or <laughs> Kit Harrington. <laughs> <laughs> You're a hard customer to please, Dane. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So uh, this movie sucks. It's awful. Don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, that's our review for Spider-Man No Way. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely see it. I, I love this movie. I didn't expect it to have such finality on it. I thought, okay, May's dead. We're going to bring her back somehow through Doctor Strange's magic. Or, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to go back and uh, Thanos is going to bring him back, bring her back <laughs> somehow and everything's going to be all right. You know? Um, no, I, I got to yeah, ask you, Dane. I, 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 yeah. I want to ask you, I, I know you said your dad's a big Spider-Man fan. Did he see it yet? I haven't talked to him yet. Okay. Uh, I, I, I will talk to him, see what he see, he, see, see what he thinks about it. I'm sure he's going to love it because he loves the uh, Toby Maguire one. As far as you know, is he so, someone who does he is he someone who pays attention to like 
leaks and spoilers and all that type of stuff. No, no, he he doesn't care about that. But what he does care about is Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Spider Man. He loves all three of those movies. He loves one, two, and of course three. He loves those movies. <laughs> See what you should do, Dane. You should try to go see with him for the first time and just secretly yeah, film his I reaction. <laughs> I know. Yesterday I was like, I should really be seeing this with my dad because I want to see his reaction, you know, live. But uh, no, he, him and my mom are gonna are gonna go see it. Uh, for some reason, my mom is really likes Zendaya. I I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the reason why she didn't like uh, Dune. Was because Zendaya only has a couple of lines at the <laughs> end. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my mom really likes Zendaya. I, I assume it's from these Spider Man movies, but, but I can't be sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll let you know what my dad thinks about it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, yeah, well, I don't feel the Toby Regard movies as much as you say he does. I don't think he'll be disappointed. He loves the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man <laughs> movies. He even loves, like I said, number three. I don't understand it. I don't know what he sees in it, but yeah, he, he loves those three movies for some reason. The same way your dad loves the Beatles, my dad likes Spider- the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. <laughs> I don't really know why. Well, the first two are great movies. The third one's half a good movie. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could understand. He, he loves both of the Andrew Garfield ones and, of course, the um, the Tom Holland ones. It's the reason why he went to go see the Avengers uh, was because of Spider-Man. He didn't care about uh, about Thanos or any of the other Avengers. Um, yeah. Don't know why. <laughs> hey, uh, so- Let's see, like Spider Man. Enough said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's all you need, right? Pretty much. That's all you need. Yeah, I was hoping for a Miles Morales. Uh, yeah, sort of peak, but yeah, you got a little reference though when Andrew Garfield was talking to Electro. Really? Yeah, where he goes like, uh, what after Electro was drained of all his powers and he was talking to Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker, he was saying like. How he still like respects Spider Man. He did good for people. He goes, I always thought, seeing you now, I always thought Spider Man was black. And then he goes, I know there's got to be a universe with a black Spider Man somewhere. <laughs> and then that got a good share for the crowd, also. Oh, oh I see. But yeah, I uh, I loved it. I, there, there's nothing really much else to say about it. Yeah. yeah. Step, go see it if you haven't already. And hopefully you enjoy it as much as we did. <laughs> Yeah. And I, like I said, I can't wait to see it again, which will be in about an hour or two. So <laughs> looking forward yeah. to that. And with that, I think that's going to do it for this episode. It's having to be a celebration of Spider-Man No Way Home and 20th anniversary of Fellowship of the Ring. And uh, this is about the period where we usually say goodbye for the year. So this will be our final episode of 2021, which means goodbye to the name at TimG311. We got to think of a new one for 2022. And as we always say, we try to think of it beforehand, but then we end up just coming up with something really basic and generic before we start recording our first episode of the year. So we'll see what we come up with at the like five minutes before we start recording our first episode of 2022. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that, Dane, I'll go ahead and throw it to you for the outro. All right. Just go over to the Batman universe dot net. Um, <laughs> if you can remember that. <laughs> <laughs> to that was at Batman in the Universe, uh, Facebook.com slash Batman Universe. Um, the show's Twitter handle is at Batman's Podcast. Tim's Twitter handle is at TimG311. I'll say it for the last time. Um, <laughs> you have to with the last handle, episode with the name TimG311. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's appropriate. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Dane Says Banana. Great reviews on iTunes. You email the show at bad time at gmail.com. So, with that, like we say at the end of every single episode, Tim. We love each and every one of you with all of our Tom, Toby, Andrew, and whatever multiverse Peter Parkers are out there. Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. See you next time, everybody.